ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا واسوتنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعه الى يوم الدين اما بعد ايها الاخوه الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وقال تعالى في القران الحكيم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وبارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت وباركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد all praise is due to allah alone he alone is worthy of all praise we seek his forgiveness guidance and his mercy no that one who is guided by allah they are truly guided one who is left to go astray they will not find a guide or a protector or a helper after that and i bear witness that there is no god but the one true god the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them and he has no partners and i bear witness that muhammad peace and prayers of allah be upon him is his slave and messenger brothers and sisters just a uh, a few things to start with um this is going to be quite intense inshallah it will be quite detailed this uh, analysis of the sira um at times for the younger audience it may be quite technical and i think you'll find that the first two or three sessions may be so as <clears throat> we won't get into the story till after that time uh i'm sorry to inform you if you thought i was going to rush straight into the story it's not going to happen inshallah the idea is to have a scholarly analysis of the whole subject uh including the story itself we'll come to come back to that in a moment um we're starting off by sitting on the floor not because it's more sunnah to sit on the floor and less <coughs> sunnah to sit at chairs and tables let me make that clear It's just that we don't have the facility here for tables and chairs at the moment but depends on what kind of attendance we have uh, and whether the other hall is available I've been told that there's another activity going on in the main hall so we'll start off like this and see how we go inshallah personally ideally I would like people to take notes even though it's being recorded uh, and uh, this was always the way of people who taught from centuries ago in fact sometimes ulama refused to teach people who took no notes and said you're just wasting my time actually um and yes sira is a story and i don't mind if people don't take notes but i encourage you to take notes i'm not going to follow the idea that we'll throw people out if i don't see them taking notes um but i think you'll benefit inshallah from uh, taking notes because none of us have the capacity to keep everything in and even if you've read sira i hope that you will find some Uh, things of uh, benefit that you've not come across before in the gas to etiquette of course etiquette of learning is crucial an etiquette of humility in learning and other than etiquette of learning from teachers is something that's been handed down to us from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam through sahaba tabi'in and those who followed them till this day uh, and it's perhaps not like the etiquette that we find in the universities and schools of today where the teacher has hardly any value or any respect in that regard and i don't mean by value and respect that we don't ask questions this is a a misunderstanding on the part of some imams and ulama who have made it in, almost impossible and this is especially so in the indian subcontinent and maybe it's not for all people but for many it is almost impossible if you ask a question it's as though you're being impertinent I know that for many decades so I'm not saying it just uh, from whim but that's not the idea that's what I don't mean that when I say that about etiquette of learning Imam Bukhari rahimahullah 
the great Imam Bukhari of Sahih al-Bukhari, the governor of his area, Bukhara, uh, almost ordered Bukhari to come and teach his children hadith, knowledge. <coughs> Imam Bukhari refused, actually. He said, no, knowledge is of value. Knowledge doesn't come to you. You have to make the effort to come to knowledge. So send them to me to come and learn from me if they're interested. So the idea, again, is that if we don't put effort and strive to learn, and effort is an actually learning and trying to absorb, trying to understand and making the effort, and that's the value of knowledge. When I talk about knowledge, I really mean understanding. Um, so, inshallah, although we're on the floor, it's difficult to take notes on the floor. I, I realize that, and then perhaps we look at uh, having tables and chairs, depending on what sort of audience and, and number of people that we have. If people want to use uh, these things that I have in front of me, perhaps it would be easier also, a little bit easier to make notes than sitting on the floor using the car. But I'll leave that to you, inshallah. <coughs> Try, obviously, we strive as always, Muslims, and whether from India, Indo Pak continent, or whether from the Arab, but it's a, I think it's a Muslim problem rather than an Indo, uh, Indo Pak problem, of timekeeping, of arriving on time. If we say 7.30, uh, we start 7.30, not uh, around about, and then 10, 20 minutes later, like we do at our weddings, uh, it's usually not 10, 20 minutes later, is it? it's usually two or three hours later. <coughs> but anyway, that's just a reminder about timekeeping for ourselves. Uh, why am I dressed like this? Not because, again, I believe sitting on the floor wearing a jalabiya is from the sunnah. Uh, when I'm sitting on the floor, today I find it comfortable to wear this, okay? But that's not the idea that we're always wearing this. I believe the sunnah <coughs> from the Prophet ﷺ is to wear the clothes of the people, of the society that uh, he was, uh, that you are in, that comes from his, uh, his sunnah. Now... Is okay to <coughs> Yes, you know, you're fine to record, inshallah, if you wish to have your own record. So let us begin, inshallah, with the topic. If you notice that I called the topic Fiqh Sira, or Fiqh Siratun Nabi, I didn't call it just Siratun Nabi. What does Fiqh mean? When I say Fiqh, I don't mean by fiqh that rules and regulations and we're going through, going through, uh, going through the rules, rules and regulations to do with uh, Islam, to ibadat, what is fad and what is not and what is sunnah, no. Because fiqh in its original meaning means understanding, means fahm. Means fahm. Uh, and Allah SWT used it like that in the Quran. Uh, uh, for example, Allah SWT says, قَدْ فَسَّلْنَ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ قَدْ فَسَّلْنَ الْآيَاتِ Indeed, we have clarified, we have explained our signs for a people who understand. For a people who understand. Or, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا Talking about disbelievers, those who reject the Qur'an and reject Islam. That Allah SWT says that they have hearts. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا they don't understand with them, meaning they, they make no effort to try and understand that. Uh, so, fiqh here means faham and understanding. The Prophet ﷺ, in his famous du'a, that he said for one of his companions, and I'll ask you who for, some of you know, he said, Allahumma faqihuhu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah, Give him understanding of the deen. وَعَلِّمْهُ تَأْوِيلُ And Ya Allah, teach him. Teach him the understanding, ta'wil, meaning the explanation of the Qur'an. <coughs> Who did he make this du'a for? Abu Abbas. Make it to Abu Abbas. Abu Abbas, close. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Who then became later known as and uh, ulama and sahaba and tabi'in say because of this du'a. He became known by the title of Turjaman al Quran by sahaba and tabi'in, the explainer of the Quran, Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was very young actually. He was young when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Uh, so, faqihu, again, to give you an idea what the meaning of. So, this is understanding. Understanding, what do I mean by it? 
it means that we're going to look at a sirah uh, more analytical level rather than just give you a, a story and narration which it will be inshallah but see where we can learn lessons from try and understand from it for lessons and contextualize to ourselves because the idea of qisas in fact in the quran of the stories is not like just uh, i was going to say jackanory but some most of the young people won't know what jackanory is but those who are my older age will know it's not just a jack and ori story where you just sit there and say you know enjoy and then uh, close the book and just finish with it and uh, nothing to do with life actually the reason for this it is to do with life it is to do with life so fuck means trying to le learn lessons and ibra as the qisas of uh, anbiya in the quran allah SWT mentions that they are for ibra for lessons for us and not just being presented there just for simple narration so people can say oh yeah that happened so the purpose of that in other words is fiqh now seerah what is seerah the word seerah comes from sara yasiru sara yasiru which in arab not sara yasiru because it changes the meaning with the scene Sara Yasiru. If you say Sara and pronounce it wrong, then it has a different meaning. Sara Yasiru means uh, to become, to become, to achieve, to reach a goal. Yeah. That's what this means. And therefore, you have the word Masir, which is the objective, the goal that you're going towards. That is the Masir. <coughs> but this is where the word Sira comes from. And Sara Yasiru means, Sara means the way somebody goes, the way somebody travels. The way somebody goes, in this case, means the way they spent their life. Yeah? So the word Sira comes from the original root word of Sara Yasiru, the way somebody goes along, uh, the way somebody travels, meaning the way they live their life, means their biography in English. The word Sira comes from that. And it doesn't come from another root which has the same letters seen and raw but that word is sarra sarra has a different meaning sarra with a, a fatha means to to be happy or to make happy yeah. to become happy or to make happy is sarra but that root has a, a different meaning totally, as you can see. It's nothing to do with biography or the way somebody goes. Sarra, in fact, interesting Arabic, from the same root, if you change that to uh, Sarra, you have Surur, which is happiness, Masrur, which is a happy person. Yeah. And if you put, instead of Fatah, Kasra in it, you have Sir. Sir means secret. Sir, Asra, secret. If you put a dhamma on it, it has a totally different meaning. Sur or Surra, what does it mean? Music. Your umbilicus. Yeah, it means your navel here. Yeah. Surra is this here. So you see Fata, Kasra, and dhamma, how it changes the meaning totally in words which are similar but this is the one we're focusing on sirah so it is to do with the biography of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sirah sirah of course can be applied to anybody the biography sirah abdullah sirah muhammad sirah of yusuf sirah you can have biography it's, it's a general word but when we use it in sharia to say sirah in the Sharia context, then most often it is referring to Rasulullah. Imam Zahabi, for example, is famous for writing his massive work, compendium, called uh, Seer and Nubala. He used the plural of Sira, Seer and Nubala, the life, the biographies of the luminaries. The biographies of the luminaries. So Imam Zahabi who is around the 8th century uh, Hijra, he, in his compendium, is looking at the life stories 
of all the scholars and uh, who were from the previous time. Sahaba, uh, Tabi'in, those who came after them, etc. So he uses the word Sira in the plural sense to refer to all the Badrus and all people. Meaning that the, the word itself, Sira, doesn't specify itself only to Rasulullah. It's a general word as, as biography is in, in English. But when we say Sira to Nabi, or as Sira, the Sira, then specifically we're talking about Rasulullah. Now, Sira is a science and a field of knowledge which is distinct from other alum and must not be mixed up. This is very important to understand. Must not be mixed up with two other terms, which are Sunnah or Hadith. Sirah is not the same as Sunnah and Hadith. There are different topics, but there is overlap. How is it overlap? For example, and let's define those first. What does Sunnah mean? Sunnah means, they say, a well-trodden path. Yeah? Sunnah is, can mean law. Uh, sunnah means tariqa, the way somebody does some uh, things, yeah, uh, and, and that's how it's used in Quran and Sunnah as well. In Quran and Hadith, that's how the term is used. Uh, for example, Allah SWT says, uh, Sunnat Allah, Sunnat Allah, uh, fil ladhina khalaw min qabl, the law of Allah, that's what it's referring to, the way of Allah. Yeah. For those who went before, for the peoples who went before, وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلَ And you will not find in the way of Allah any change. So Allah SWT established certain laws and rules and, and regulations. So, so the word sunnah is used in the Quran actually referring to Allah's sunnah. Yeah. So Allah's way, Allah's law. Um, but it is... As I said, it refers to the way somebody uh, does something. But we'll come to see what it actually has other meanings in regards to when we come to uh, Islam. But in the general meaning of, of, that, uh, uh, of that sense, the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he said in an authentic hadith, which is reported by Ibn Majah, he said, uh, ﷺ, Man sanna sunnatan. Hasanatan fa umila biha ba'dahu kana lahu ajruhu wa mithlu ujurihim min ghayri an yanqusa min ujurihim shay'a. The Prophet said, whoever introduces a new way, something, whoever introduces something, they set up something which has, is good. So he's using the word sunnah. Man sanna sunnah. So he's not referring to his sunnah. He's referring to anybody who, who, who introduces something in life which is good, hasanatan, and others follow it after him or her. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ said that he or she will have the reward for it and the reward for those who continue doing something good like that after that person, yeah, without the others losing any reward from the good that they did. And the opposite, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said as well, Man sanna sunnatan sayyi'a. So what's going to happen with that? Whoever introduces something which is bad or negative. Yeah, and this is a warning for us. Yeah, warning especially for ulama and imams and others who people are watching or people are learning from. That they introduce some bad and others then take up that bad behavior or bad idea and they follow it in, the, in, in, in that sense as well. It becomes established even after them. Then they will have the sin of that and the sin of those who followed them as well. So that's like, you know, introducing bad things and you're showing and encouraging others to do that bad. 
So here the word sunnah is used in that sense. Of course, introducing a new sunnah, here we have to be careful what it means. It has a general meaning, but it certainly would cut across the deen of Islam if somebody says, well, I'm going, I'm going to introduce a sixth prayer now. Would that come under this category? It would come under sunnah sayyia, actually. It would come under bid'ah. That is bid'ah haqiqiyya. Yeah, that is clear innovation, which will break the principles of Islam. So you can't just introduce anything willy-nilly. Yeah, what something has been established in the deen, especially in aqidah and ibadah, we have no way of introducing something new in that. Somebody suddenly out of the blue starts saying, well, I'm going to start fasting every Wednesday and do Qiyamul Layl on Wednesday because Wednesday is really special holy night. On what basis do you say that? This is not introducing Sunnah to Hassan. You understand me? Yeah. This is uh, this is bid'ah. So, um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself use, uses the word Sunnah on a, a few occasions. For example, on a few occasions. For example, if we say, he said, An nikahu min sunnati, fa man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. That marriage is from my sunnah, my way. And whoever rejects my way, they're not from, from me. Yeah. And this is one of the evidences that ulama used to show that marriage is uh, uh, mustahab, highly recommended yeah, to strive to get married. To strive to get married. They didn't they necessarily put, majority of them didn't put it at the level of fard. Yeah. Left it at mustahab, highly recommended. As long as somebody's unable to get married, there were ulama like Imam Shafi and others, a few who never got married. Uh, and they also died relatively young because they were busy with their studies and teaching, etc. Not because they rejected marriage. The, what changes it is somebody rejecting marriage and saying, I'm not going to get married. That is against the sunnah of Rasulullah Now, how do we understand the word sunnah further? Sunnah has various meanings. Aside from the foundational meaning I've given you, the way of somebody doing something. <clears throat> but sunnah, for example, for the fuqaha, which is the lawyers, for example, of Islam. We say fuqaha, we mean the faqis, <coughs> the ones who come out with the rules and regulations deriving from the sources. The fuqaha say, for example, that all of Islamic teaching can be divided into five categories. Five categories. Everything of the teaching. And the biggest of those categories is in the middle. What are the five categories? Say, wajib or fart. That which is obligatory, you have to do. If you don't do it, it's a sin. You'll be punished. Yes? Then, mustahab. That which is highly recommended. Doing it, you are rewarded. If you don't do it, then you are not punished and it's not counted as sin. That mustahab is also known as mandub and as sunnah. Meaning it is a value in the level of the ruling. It is a legal ruling called sunnah. Yeah? So, uh, for the fuqaha, you can use the word mustahab, mandub, and sunnah interchangeably. What does it mean? It means it is sunnah to do that. When a fuqi says it, it means it is highly recommended to do that. And if you don't do it, nevertheless, uh, it is not a sin. Then, of course, the third category, mubah, which is everything is allowed under the category of mubah. Then, makru, which is disliked for you to do. But if you do it, then you are not sinning. Then haram, of course, is very clear, forbidden for you to do. And if you do it, there is sin in it. Those are the five categories. So sunnah is one of the categories of legal ruling in the gradation, as it were. In the gradation. Nevertheless, sunnah has other meanings as well. For example, when the people of jurisprudence, usuliyin, they use the word sunnah, what do they mean? What do they mean? They mean that in looking to derive rulings, where do we go? Looking to derive rulings from our deen, 
What is our source? The first source, they say, is Kitab. What is the Kitab? Quran al-Kareem. What is the second source? What do they say? The Sunnah. They actually use the word Sunnah. What do they mean by that? They mean Hadith. So now, Sunnah means Hadith. See, it is a different meaning to the legal gradation ruling of what Sunnah means. Here now, when you use it in that sense, you're saying, I am, after the Quran, I refer to the Sunnah. I refer to Hadith as source of deriving and getting evidence for a particular issue. So Sunnah equals Hadith in this case. Yeah. Sunnah equals Hadith. I will come to Hadith in a minute. So when we say, but another way people use the word sunnah and the public and others is in a much more looser way. Yeah? Um, we get this from the sunnah. That means we get it from the hadith. Or it is sunnah to do this. It is sunnah to do this was used by Sahaba and Tabi'een as well and it continued <coughs> with scholars after that as well. When they said it is sunnah to do this, what did they mean? It is sunnah to do this could have the meaning, they could say it is sunnah not to do this. You understand? It is sunnah to stay away from this. It is sunnah to do this so it is sunnah to stay away from this means that something is either makruh or haram. It's not clear from using that term like this. You follow me? I told you it would be a bit technical today. <coughs> so when they say it is sunnah to stay away from, but that term used here doesn't tell us what level of staying away from. It could be makruh, it could be haram. It is sunnah to do this could mean also two levels. It is either fard or wajib or it could be mustahab. It could be recommended or it could be obligatory. Yeah. Actually, it is also could be under mubah allowed. For example, for example, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu or Ibn Abbas, Ali for example, stood up when he was in Kufa outside the masjid gate he did this they brought him water and he waited till the gathering of asr after Dhuhr he stayed there and he waited till the people gathered for asr prayer till they came back so they brought him water and he first took the water and made wudu in front publicly at the door on purpose so people were watching then he stood up took the same vessel container and stood up and drank water from it and he explained to them that this is a sunnah to do this. I saw the messenger of Allah, then he explains. Now he's referring to a hadith. Yeah. He says it's sunnah to do this, because I saw the messenger of Allah when he was given water, zamzam water in fact, that he stood up and drank water like this. What he was having a go at were those from the tabi'in in his time who were objecting to people standing and drinking water. So in at uh, opposition to that, he's saying, doing it in front of them to break those ideas and say it is sunnah to do this. What he means by sunnah to do this, it doesn't mean it's obligatory to do that, does he? It's not obligatory to stand up and drink water. Does he mean it's mustahab? He doesn't really, because you have to understand the context. It's not recommended. He's saying it is mubah. It is allowed to do this. And because we have other hadith where Prophet Sassam sat and drank water. So what Ali radiallahu an is saying in authentic hadith this is, that this is allowed. Just like you think sitting. But if you think sitting is the only way, he's objecting to that. And he's saying this is allowed. So when he says here it's sunnah, he means it is mubah. It is allowed for you to stand and drink water. So in that sense, now, many meanings of sunnah. When we come to Sunnah and Hadith as a source, Hadith, Hadith is a totally different area to Sirah. That's my point here. 
Hadith means itself news or report. Also means the message or speech. It's used in all those senses in Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah. The word Hadith. Hal ataka hadithu Musa? Has the news of Musa reached you? Hal ataka hadithu al-Ghashiya? Has the news of the overwhelming event reached you? Yeah, which is Qiyamah. So, uh, so it's used in that sense. Or, uh, uh, فَذَرْنِي وَمَنْ يُكَذِّبُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ Allah SWT is saying in the Quran, So leave to me, like warning, So leave those people who يُكَذِّبُ yeah, Who reject this hadith, talking about the Quran. So Allah is using the word hadith for the Quran. فَذَرْنِي وَمَنْ يُكَذِّبُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ Leave them to me. In other words, I will sort, sort them out for those who are rejecting and denying. So, uh, hadith is used in that sense. Hadith is used in the sense of, of speech and talking. Uh, or for the message, as it is in this case. Uh, and the, similarly, the Prophet ﷺ used the word hadith in a similar sense. Ahsan al-hadithi kitab Allah. The best of speech or the best of message is the book of Allah. Yeah. Or he used it in a sense of his own hadith. Which is the meaning that we have, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. The Prophet said in an authentic hadith, for example, if we take part of it, he says, Nadar Allahu, Nadar Allahu Imra'in, Nadar Allahu Amran, Alladhi Sami'a Minni Hadithan, Alladhi Sami'a Minni Hadithan, Fa فَيُبَلِّغُهُ كَمَا سَمِعَهُ وَرُبَّ رُبَّ الْمُبَلَّغْ أَوْ آمِنْ سَامِعَ He said, good news, glad tidings for the person who, take, who listens to me and takes from me. سَمِعَ مِنِّي حَدِيثًا Takes from me hadith. And he or she then takes it and passes it on and transmits it, transmits it, to, transmits it to someone else. As he or she heard it, encouraging to be accurate in the transmission. Yeah. And perhaps the one who receives the hadith from the one who's heard it from me will be more understanding of it than the one who's transmitting. Isn't that good news and bushra that people from Tabi'een and those who come after them, yeah, some of them will be more clever in their understanding fit than some of the Sahaba. That's what he's saying, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sahaba themselves, different levels of understanding. There were the ulama of sahab, sahaba, and there were those who were not ulama who just transmitted. They didn't have the same level of understanding. So, hadith, in the technical sense, not like sira, hadith is used to mean qawl, fa'l, and ikrar, and sifa. If you look at hadith, it's a report, which is a connected report going back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does it contain? It contains information about the sayings of the Messenger of Allah, the doings of the Messenger of Allah, and his ikrar. What's ikrar? <clears throat> Just to keep you awake. What's ikrar? Somebody did an action and he did, he did not say anything against it. Yeah. In English we say tacit approval. That's right? silent approval. Ikrar. He didn't he didn't criticize it. You no, know, he just stayed quiet, which means all Allah took from that, it's allowed. Because if it wasn't, he would say, No, don't do this. So Ikrar and Sifa. Sifa is describing Rasulullah. What he was like. Yeah? Uh, so that is hadith. Hadith. Hadith covers those four areas. However, when we talk about sunnah, and the people of jurisprudence talk about going to the second source sunnah, there is slight difference between hadith and sunnah there. Because the sunnahs that they look at, or the hadith that they look at for lawmaking or rulemaking, Excludes one category in the ca four categories of hadith. Which category does it exclude? 
four categories of uh, in hadith was <coughs> his sayings, his doings, his tacit approvals, and his description. Which category is excluded for making rules and regulations for the Muslim Ummah? Come on. His description. Yeah. He's describing the, mess the messenger of Allah. Yeah. Just as you can't look like him. Yeah. If he's encouraging a particular thing in his libas or in his uh, whatever he does with his beard, mustache, he will say it with his words. His, the way he walks, what he preferred to eat, yeah, for example, they are from his adat, for example. Yeah. So when ulama of fiqh look at sunnah, they extract from the three and leave the fourth one, which is still in hadith, but it is not part of looking as a source for making rules and regulations in a general sense. Nevertheless, even under the category of sunnah, the way the Prophet ﷺ did things, Ulama then, for completion, divided the sunnah into those three areas of uh, sayings, doings, and tacit approvals. Yeah, but under the doings, they looked at his his particular likes and dislikes for him. For example, uh, simple example, Khalid ibn Walid, for example, they were together at one time with the Messenger of Allah, and they were cooking the desert lizard. The dub. Cooking the desert lizard, lizard, the Sahaba, to eat. And they offered it to the Prophet and he said, no. He refused it. He said, um, he refused it. And when he refused it, of course, Sahaba want to know, is it haram? So Khalid ibn Walid took it and he said, Ya Rasulullah, or Messenger of Allah, is it haram? The Messenger of Allah said, no, it is not haram. I was not brought up in my family eating this kind of food. That's why I just don't prefer it. So Khalid ibn Walid, in front of the rest of the Sahaba, took it and ate it. Right? Which is very, very good understanding mm -hmm. to show because the Messenger of Allah is saying it. Mm -hmm. But they were used to eating it, the others. You know, this is showing that his uh, that his preference was he didn't uh, like to uh, eat that, but didn't stop others from uh, doing it. Garlic and onions. Had he made it uh, forbidden, I don't know what we would have been doing for curries and things, would we? <laughs> for garlic and onion. We would really be up the, up the shoot, as they say. Um, not that we took much notice of, he didn't forbid it, but he said to the one eating from garlic and onion, he said, don't, one who has eaten from these khabifan, he called it, these filthy two, <laughs> he called them the, the two filthy uh, herbs, one who has eaten from it, don't come to the masjid. You know that? Don't come to the masjid. Right? So because of the smell. Alright? And of course, then we can elaborate from that. If he said it for garlic and onion, what about strong smelling curry? Yeah? But of course, if we have toothpaste, toothbrush, mouthwash, uh, 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 perfume, atar, used all that, then come to the masjid. That was the reason for it. Anyway. So, mentioning some examples to do with uh, uh, his adat. So that's why some ulama said that we have sunnah, which is tashri'i, means sunnah from which we can derive rules. But some of his adat, they said it's sunnah, it's his way, but it is ghayru tashri'i. It is not for deriving rules from. Yeah. It is particular to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now, sirah itself. Sirah is itself, I have to differentiate mainly from something, of course, Quran, we're very clear. Yeah. Quran, which has been preserved, yeah, word for word, from Jibreel, from Allah, Jibreel, mouth of Rasulullah, for written at the time of Rasulullah, until this day, till Yom Al-Qayyamah, till he's raised up. <clears throat> hadith, Hadith is a very specialist field, poorly understood by many. Actually, poorly understood by many, many even uh, studious people and academics in the Muslim world. And many people took it actually from Orientalists as well, who really poorly understand it. But it is a, a, a great science which was developed by some real luminaries and great ulama, muhaddithin. Muhaddithin were not just transmitters, they were people who were critics. 
critics of hadith. Yeah? And they always existed throughout the centuries. Some people think that hadith criticism has just been started now by the Turkish government 20 years ago. People who think that are totally ignorant of anything about ulum al-hadith and our heritage. Because this started as Sahaba's time. And many people actually also think, and this is often first people to be guilty of that, are Muslims themselves, including some ulama and a'ima, and many a'ima actually. A'ima I mean imams and mulbis. Imams, I don't necessarily call them ulama. Many people have transmitted this idea to the Muslim masses and taken from Orientalists who have this idea, because we passed it to them as well, that hadith writing, for example, started, it is hadith is like the Gospels. Its writing started 250 uh, years or so because Imam Bukhari died in 255, etc. That's when it started. It is so far from the truth. So far from the truth. Because real search of those who are in the field of al hadith will show us that hadith writing actually started as Sahaba's time. And that the writings were available to the Tabi'een. And many more Tabi'een wrote from the Sahaba. And all those books were available. They're not available now, but they became available to those who come after them to refer to and to listen to and double check and triple check. So from them came the compilation through written transmission as well as verbal transmission. As well as verbal transmission. This is such an important point to understand. Uh, very foundation of hadith literature. Um, Abu Huraira an may not have written himself, and he is one of the famous uh, companions who transmitted nearly 2,000 hadith, famously said, the only reason Ibn Omar, or he said, uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, transmits more hadith than me, perhaps, is because he writes them down, and I try and learn them off by heart. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, therefore, is writing hadith. He's Sahab, as did Ibn Omar. As did Abdullah ibn Abbas. We have evidence through research, especially research done by the likes of uh, Muhammad Mustafa al a great Hadith scholar who in the last uh, decades wrote some great researches to rebuttal the ideas of the Orientalists and those from the Muslim Ummah who came with this twisted idea of uh, Hadith being only concocted and brought together 250 years later. Uh, like the Gospels. Gospels and Hadith, there is no match. Absolutely no match. Um, so, Sahaba wrote from Abu Huraira. There were many students who wrote from him. Sahaba are alive, transmitting Hadith. So, Tabi'in are writing. And from them, many other students. And it continued like that. Yeah, They had their own manuscripts of written Hadith corroborated and could be checked. And they also... The other thing, of course, we cannot escape that the Arabs of the time and later centuries, this has been very, very distinct in the Muslim Ummah, their memories of learning were absolutely amazing. The Arabs from even before Islam, Jahiliya, well known for knowing lineage off by heart, for going back many, many generations and poetry which extends to pages and pages and pages and pages and their history, learning off by heart. Yeah. They were well known for that. And in fact, what we find in some of the early scholars, some of the early scholars, that they, they sort of showed their great memory by preferring to narrate by memory, as perhaps I'm doing now, rather than reading from the book. But they were showing their students that they're acute in their memory. It's not that they didn't have it in writing. There's an encouragement, actually, by some to narrate uh, of Baha, but the few. Because few of the ulama of pre, uh, early times said, uh, the best knowledge is that which is here. Because that which is in the books, what the meaning is, but it's just in the book is written, you don't really understand it. It's when it sinks in and you understand it. That is, that's what they meant. But the majority went for uh, uh, putting writing uh, at, the, at the top level. So, in this regard, I would say that I'm just giving you a little glimpse, a little, very miniature glimpse of 
uh, hadith and people famously and orientalists used it as well and others use it as well and said oh well we have a hadith authentic from the Prophet Sallallahu when he said uh, لا تكتبوا أني إلا القرآن ومن كتب, ومن كتب ومن كتب مني غير القرآن فليمحوه This is a very famous hadith. It is reported by Imam Muslim. It is reported by three Sahaba. Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Huraira and Abu Sayyid al-Khudri. In its chain, Muhaddithin said, not present day, donkeys years ago, right to the early times. They said that all the chains of this hadith are weak, except one. All the chains of the hadith are weak because the narrator, the narrator who's mentioned from Abu Huraira and Zayd ibn Thabit <coughs> and one of the narrations from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri uh, is uh, well known amongst the muhaddithin of the time to be a weak narrator, not dependable. So the hadith will be rejected as having a cut in it. It is not going back to the Messenger of Allah. Only one hadith is authentic, as Muhammad Mustafa al-Azami and other uh, leading scholars of hadith say. And that is one of the chains from Abu Sayyid al-Khudri. Imam Bukhari decided, even though it is authentic up to Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, Imam Bukhari, the great Imam Bukhari, who was a great crit critic of hadith, said that this hadith is authentic, but it is mawkuf. Meaning it is the opinion of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri. It is not transmitted from Rasulullah It is not. Imam Bukhari further said that even, even, and we have evidence actually, that even Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, if it is his opinion, we have evidence that even he wrote some hadith. Which shows that even the ulama who took it as authentic to Rasulullah and made it very clear what does it mean. There are two ways of looking at it. One, they said, if it is authentic to Rasulullah and Bukhari doesn't think so, Imam Muslim did think so, if it is authentic, what it meant was, don't write other things on the same parchment that you're writing the Quran from me, Rasulullah is saying. Because he didn't want the writing of the Quran mixed up with even his own comments and hadith. Yes? So what they meant was, don't write on the same page. So it doesn't cause confusion. Yeah. Others said that this was early on when the Quran started being revealed to make sure that people knew to how to separate the Quran and it became abrogated this commandment later. The reality is, the reality is this hadith, even if it is authentic, in no way prevents, and the evidence is there, Sahaba from writing down from writing down. And the Prophet Sallallahu in the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As who said that I used to write from the Prophet Sallallahu everything. So Mushrikeen, Mushrikeen, the idol which was, saw him doing this and said, what's the matter with you? you foolish or something. You're writing from him everything. Sometimes he's upset, sometimes he's cross, sometimes he's angry, and you just go and write everything. <coughs> so the life of Amr ibn Al said, I, this is authentic hadith, by the way. He said, I became bewildered by what they said and upset. So I went to the Messenger of Allah. And I said, I reported to him what they said. Prophet Sallallahu said, he said, وَالَّذِي nafsi bi By Allah, in whose hand is my soul, Write from me everything, for surely nothing but truth comes out of my mouth. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now why is he telling him to write if writing is forbidden? This is a clear, authentic, strong hadith. Yeah, this is the evidence that we need to use. Yeah, and I uh, told you that it was being written down by many sahaba, many tabi'in after that. And it continued like that, and it was being critiqued. I don't want to go into the whole issue of ulum hadith. Just suffice it to say, that Sira, Sira is not like Ulum al Hadith. It is not being critiqued. It is not based on the Isnad, the chain, where every person in the chain 
His life is known, he's checked whether he's a liar, whether he makes mistakes, whether he uh, uh, makes up things, whether he actually got it from the person before or whether <coughs> he didn't, or whether the person from him or her got it from them. All that, were they in the same city? Did they meet each other? Did they hear it or did they get it from the book? And when they got it, they compare it to other students who got the same hadith from the same person and compare and see who made the mistake, who makes most mistakes. You see, it's such a deep... Uh, I, I studied it from my... It's such an amazing field. Yeah, but very specialist field. Very specialist field. So all that is for... And that's why we have authentic hadith and weak hadith and fabricated hadith. We have that. We have it right from time immemorial. Not now. It's already there. Right from early times. Right from early times. Sira was a bit different. Sira was a bit different. Sira started out, and again, people have the idea again that Sira started being written. Uh, Orientalists will mention this, and others think that oh, the first person was Adu. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, Omar, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, he was the one who told Imam Zuhri, uh, Muhammad ibn Muslim, ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Al-Zuhri, who died in 124 Hijri, was no doubt a great scholar and a great Imam of Medina. He was a teacher to so many, so many, so uncountable number of students. They used to come and learn from him. And a great transmitter of hadith. Great transmitter of hadith, but not a critique of hadith. He wasn't amongst those who are known as nuqad. Yeah? Not a critique of hadith. However, there's plenty of evidence that Maghazi, Maghazi is the, is the name that was used in early times for the life, the biography of Rasulullah What does Maghazi mean? The battles. Because it was the way of the <coughs> Arabs, before Islam came, they were famous, and actually, I think it's across the world. If you cross the world, what people remember, in history especially, are the battles, don't they? Yeah, The Battle of Hastings, 1066, the Battle of such and such, the, you know, uh, of Wellington. Or <coughs> if you look at history, every nation's history, they look at the battles yeah, as the key. And that's how it was. So, Sira originally was also <coughs> titled, their books were titled Kitab al-Maghazi, the book of battles. Yeah. Because there they could mention their heroism and the heroism of the Sahaba against the Kufa, etc. So most of it was focused around that, a little bit around the life in Mecca and Medina. But that's how it started out. However, it is very uh, clear that there were some Sahaba who were especially known for their special interest in Maghazi, yeah, <laughs> like Abdullah ibn Abbas, Bara ibn Al Bara ibn Azab, and uh, 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 the likes of these companions. And then we find that the writing of Sira also started at Tabi'in time, with the likes of, for example, uh, Urwa ibn Zubayr al Awwam. Urwa was one of the greatest scholars of the Tabi'in. And Urwa is the nephew of Aisha Ta Ummul Mu'mini and Aisha Anha. Urwa used to say that the greatest scholar that I ever met, you know what he said? Aisha Ta Aisha Ta Anha. The greatest scholar I ever came across was Aisha Ta Anha. And he uh, learned uh, from her, aside from other Sahaba. Urwa wrote on Nawazi, on Sira. And Orwa is the one who uh, passed away in 93 after Hijra. Yeah. So all the Sahaba are around. He passed away then, so he's doing his writing a lot earlier than that. Yeah. Um, and, and then you have the likes of Aban, who's famous for writing about Maghazi and knowing about Maghazi. Aban <coughs> ibn uh, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, Aban, who died around 100 years after Hijra. He's well known for this field of Sira and Maghazi as well. Uh, and the likes of uh, other uh, uh, Amir al-Sha'bi, the great Tabi'i scholar, 
also famous for his book on Marazi, Kitab al Marazi, a Sira book that he wrote. But of course, in line, and he, uh, uh, Amr al Shabi, is younger than uh, Imam Zori, who I mentioned died in 124. Imam Zori has so many students. His works and the students who learned from him became, of course, he's taking his words from the likes of the ones I've mentioned to you. He's not just plucked it out of the blue, yeah? 70, 80 years later and said, mm, I think I'll write about Sira now. Let me think what I can make up. He's, he's learning from those I mentioned before, from the Sahaba and Tabi'een. He's a young Tabi'i, Imam Zuhri. So he's learning from senior Tabi'een. Uh, Tabi'een mean, meaning they meet him with Sahaba. So Imam Zuhri has famous students. Very famous students. Imam Zuhri's famous students are... Uh, many, but the three that we need to remember are Musa ibn Uqba, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, and uh, <coughs> the likes uh, of, uh, oh, also actually you have uh, um, uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi. Amongst these students, the best of these students was Musa ibn Uqba. Musa ibn Uqba who uh, died around 140 after Hijra, is, had his own book on Sirah. That book is not extant now, but that was available for centuries after Musa ibn Uqba for scholars to refer to. Yeah? The likes of Ibn Hajar looked at it, the likes of Imam Zahabi looked at it from the 8th century after Hijra, but it's been lost, lost since then. So that, Musa ibn Uqba was well known as being a, 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 a good transmitter, a reliable transmitter in Hadith, and therefore his transmission from Imam Zori was probably the best transmission of Sirah, which others had access to. The second level was Muhammad ibn Ishaq. The most famous to this day writer of Sirah is Ibn Ishaq. Sirah ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq, who died about 150 after Hijra, yeah, so a little bit later, is the most famous student of Imam Zori for transmitting Sirah. However, in regards to Ibn Ishaq, how did Muhaddithin see him? Muhaddithin, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, for example, the great Muhaddith and the, uh, the, the, the leader of the Hanbali school of thought, Ibn Hanbal, who was great in Hadith, and a critic of Hadith, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who died 241 after Hijra, just 10-15 years before Imam Bukhari, <coughs> said when he was asked about Ibn Ishaq and his reliability, he said, Laysa bi kahada. He is not relied upon when he's transmitting like this, like other people who transmit Sahih Hadith, authentic Hadith. But he's suduq, he is truthful, he's good, but he makes mistakes. He mixes up uh, chains and mixes up the, uh, the hadith at times. And if he also doesn't say, I heard this directly, then we look at his hadith. Because perhaps he didn't hear it from the person. And if he comes with a hadith which no one else came with, then we also have to triple check his hadith before we accept it, because it may be a mistake. Now, he is writing sirah. All ulama of hadith with sirah, they were relaxed. Because they felt Sira, from Sira they were not going to bring any rules and regulations. Sira was not seen like Hadith. Sira was seen like storytelling. So they were more relaxed with it. Yeah? So they said it's okay for Ibn Ishaq to transmit Sira. We're not going to give the same level of importance and critique as we did with the chains of Hadith with Sira. And they didn't. Although Ibn Ishaq came with the same way and he put chains there. But many of the chains he transmitted with had breaks <coughs> in them, had people who were liars or people who were mis uh, making mistakes or people who not met each other. So, Sira as a whole does not have the same level of authenticity, that's what I'm trying to say to you, as Hadith. Do not be fooled. The Sira stories, therefore, need to be taken with a pinch of salt. However, however, not all of it, because the source of Sira isn't only Ibn Ishaq. This is very important to remember. Sira, first of all, is in the Quran. 
Badr Uhud tells you about what's going on. So Quran is coming with some seerah, yeah, but not great details. Then seerah, of course, is in hadith. Yeah. Majority of hadith from the sayings and doings is not contextualizing which year it happened and it happened after this happened. But, but some of them do. Yeah. On the day of Fatu Makkah, this is what happened. It's in hadith. Yeah. And the last Hajj of uh, the Prophet, Sassam, this is what he said and did. It's in hadith. Yeah. So there are instances and times and places which have been transmitted in all the ahadith books Bukhari, Muslim, Sayyid uh, Say Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, uh, Abu Dawood, Musnad Ahmad, Al Muwatta, all of them. So they are parts where, so if we want to get authentic seerah, we go secondly to the hadith books to get seerah after the Quran. Then thirdly, we come to the books on seerah. Like that of Ibn Ishaq, for example. Ibn Ishaq was independent. And the third person I should mention to you, Al Waqidi. Al Waqidi was a famous student of Imam Zuhri. Lots of knowledge, lots of teaching and transmission. But the Muhaddithin said he is a liar. Al Waqidi and two or three others are the most famous transmitters of early Islamic history. So most of it cannot be relied upon. I'm sorry to say. Most of it cannot be relied upon. Ibn Sa'ad, Ibn Sa'ad is the other famous one who wrote At-Tabaqat Al-Kubra. At-Tabaqat Al-Kubra, which is about 10 volumes. The first two volumes are about <coughs> Shirat nabi However, Ibn Sa'ad, he didn't take from uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq, he took a lot from Waqadi. So Ibn Sa'ad, although he himself was a great scholar who came in the 6th century, died around 540, uh, 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 middle of the 6th century, he takes a lot from <coughs> al waqidi So you can imagine then there's a lot of things in that seerah which are going to be questionable, yeah? taken with a pinch of salt. Imam Zahabi, however, said that uh, Ibn Sa'ad also took from two or three muhaddithin as well who were... Uh, truthful in their transmission. So there are bits there which are uh, 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 true as well. The most famous person, the, the <coughs> person who made the Ibn, uh, Ibn Ishaq Sira most world famous and till this day is who? Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham is not the direct student of Ibn Ishaq. There is somebody in between them called Al-Bakka'i. Zaid, Zaid, uh, 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 I think it's Abdullah al-Bakka'i, al al but Zaid al-Bakka'i. He is good, good in, in the sense he's trustworthy and reliable, the intermediary. Yeah? He is the one who transmits the seerah of Ibn Ishaq through him to Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham is a, a, a bigger scholar actually than Ibn Ishaq, the one who is taken it from. So Ibn Hisham takes a lot away of the uh, weak transmissions which are coming from Jews and Christians. He removes a lot of that. He's a, a scholar in language and a scholar in genealogy. So he adds his uh, 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 stuff as well. So what we have today, the most famous of those works is Ibn Hisham. Ibn Sa'ad, I've already told you. Uh, uh, there. The other one uh, is uh, Tariq. Tariq of the history book, Tariq al-Kabir of Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. Al-Tabari is famous from the Tafsir of Tabari. The, one of the most famous and greatest of Tafsir before Ibn Kathir was Tabari Tafsir. Imam <laughs> Ibn Jarir al-Tabari who died in 310 uh, Hijri. His Tariq al-Kabir is not the same as his Tafsir. And there is his Sirah as well. And again, it is mostly based on transmissions from Ibn Ishaq. He didn't do any real <coughs> critique of it either. So that uh, is existent. Others wrote um, as well, like Imam al-Zahabi wrote uh, Sirah. Uh, um, Ibn al-Qayyim from the 8th century and Imam al-Zahabi from the 8th century after Hijra as well. Ibn al-Qayyim wrote Zad al-Ma'ad, the preparations for the return. His famous, most famous book. In that he also has a section to do with Sirat al-Nabi. Again, he didn't fall... Uh, going to critique and, and separating the authentic from the non-authentic. He didn't spend too much time uh, in that regard. There are other books uh, which are 
more to do with, and from early times to this day, which are to do with, they're known as, uh, and I know we're running out of time, they're known as A'lam um, al-Nubuwa or Dala'il al-Nubuwa. They are to do with uh, 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 evidences for prophethood. Yeah? So they look at that aspect only, they're not looking at the whole life story. Yeah? And people like Al-Asbahani and Al-Zahabi, there's great scholars, they wrote books on that. A'lam al yeah, the evidences uh, uh, showing a prophethood, that he was a prophet, specialist thing. Other books are like a Shama'il. Shama'il, um, the most famous one is of Tirmidhi. Tirmidhi, the great scholar of Hadith from the 3rd century, who wrote a Shama'il. Shama'il means looking at the physical descriptions, yeah, khalq and khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Looking at his physical descriptions, and I uh, studied most of it, I went through it, I haven't finished, finished with it. Not everything in it is authentic. Shaykh Albani, in fact, did a critique of a Shama'il uh, and tried to point out which hadith were uh, uh, authentic and which were not to do with describing his behavior and his appearance. Because Imam Tirmidhi, when he did that, didn't put the same stringent criteria in this book as he did for his book, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, al jamia So he never claimed that I'm going to just give you authentic hadith. He was more lax with it in this book. Uh, Shama'il was a, 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 a title also uh, do, done by other scholars on the same lines. The other famous uh, classical book that we should know about <coughs> is Al-Shifa of Qadi Ayyad. Qadi Ayyad was the great Maliki uh, uh, Spanish scholar who wrote uh, uh, Al-Shifa. Al-Shifa is not really Sira. It focuses mainly on the virtues of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his uh, uh, maqam on the Day of Judgment and his station, how we should send salam and why we should send salam and salam on the Messenger of Allah, loving the Messenger of Allah, hating and insulting the Messenger of Allah, that's what he focuses on. It's a very good book, although I don't like the chapter on those who insult the Prophet, what their end should be. Very harsh. Not relevant to our time, certainly. So, and his evidences don't agree with them because all of them to do with the hereafter and punishment in the hereafter. Nothing to do with actually killing them in this world. Anyway, that's a separate issue. So, um, to finish off with today, I know it's very technical. There are books that are available. The ones I mentioned in Arabic are Ibn Hisham, it's available in Arabic, and uh, Qali Iyad, which is also in English, this one's in English actually, uh, as Shifa. Tirmidhi's as Shama'il, to do with the character, not Sira, is also being translated, uh, available in English as well as Arabic. Uh, but um, <coughs> there are, in Arabic, in the 70s, there's a, a, a circle of ulama linked with Iraq and uh, Medina that started doing <coughs> a 10-year study. And the lead person for that who has written his book after the 10-year study is somebody called Akram Dia, Dia al Omari. This is only in Arabic. It's a scholarly piece of work I, uh, uh, which I've been studying. Um, and that is brilliant. Here he has taken all the narrations, because he is a muhaddith, and a critic of hadith from all the various books from Quran, from hadith books and from the Sira books and tried to then bring out the most authentic story and Sira of Rasulullah So inshallah I'll be referring to that. The other person who did that to some extent, not to this level, was Shibli Nomani in India. And his book on Sira to Nabi is absolutely brilliant as well. It was him and Suleiman and uh, Nadawi because he uh, died uh, rahimahullah before he completed it but his manuscripts were available to Suleiman and Nadwi who completed that task uh, and, and it's been translated into English as well it was originally done in Urdu um, uh, and that is an amazing book uh, as well uh, that is Sirat al Nabi in, in English it's three volumes the only volume that we have to be careful of is that because uh, Shibli Nomani was influenced by the likes of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan who was influenced by the British very much and uh, uh, um, therefore Sir, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He was a scholar of the time of India, but he was, in my understanding, an apologetic 
because, because of him, Shibli Nomani rejects all miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He rejects them to try to rationalize it, and there's no need for that. So that's the only thing, but, you know, which scholars perfect, everybody has some flaws or makes some mistakes here and there. That's not to take anything away from this book. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, because the one I'm talking about is not available. This is perhaps the nearest thing. Uh, it doesn't go to uh, corroborate at the level of the, the Arab scholar I mentioned earlier on. Other books which I've studied over the years, this is uh, uh, Ibn Hisham. If you want that in English, then study Martin Ling's. Anybody studied it? Muhammad Rasulullah in English. Martin Ling's is basically this in English. Uh, with some additions here and there. Muhammad Rasulullah is a very good book. This has been well used, as you can see, uh, by uh, um, Abu Hassan Nadwi, rahimahullah. Uh, a very good book, brilliant book. Uh, going, these are ones are basically going back to Ibn Hisham. This is another one, Life of Muhammad, by uh, Abdul Hamid Siddiqui. There was Muhammad, Benefactor of Humanity, by Naeem Siddiqui. Uh, the more recent one is The Sealed Nectar. <coughs> He doesn't go to the critical level of the likes of what I've mentioned before, but still he brings in Quran and a lot of authentic hadith on, in situations to clarify from Bukhari, Muslim, and other hadith books whether this, what was happening, uh, which is a, a very good uh, way. So in that sense, it's very good. Those are some of the books that I recommend that you can look at. I'm sorry, I have to stop there because it's time for Salah. I was trying to make sure I finish with this section so I don't come back with it next time. <laughs> next time, inshallah, we will look at why do we need to study the seerah uh, and we will look specifically uh, at, uh, <laughs> uh, at the things to do with love of the Messenger of Allah and sending slurm and uh, salah on him. Uh, after that, then we will move on to uh, the beginnings of, uh, of, uh, of, of seerah. I'll say that 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 I'll say that